Hi class! Today you will begin learning about the topic of phylogeny. In this topic you will learn how to interpret evolutionary trees, such as the beautiful tree shown in this picture, which shows the relationships between insects. And then eventually you will also learn how to draw evolutionary trees. So first let's look at this picture. When you see this animal, what do you think it is? I would bet you'd think it's a snake, but actually it is a lizard. So how do scientists know that this organism is a lizard and not a snake? So we'll begin learning about that today. In today's lesson, you will learn how to read a phylogenetic tree, the difference between a homology versus a homoplasy, and then the use of morphological versus molecular comparisons for making phylogenetic trees. Okay, so first let's talk about what we mean by the terms phylogeny and phylogenetic tree. A phylogeny is the evolutionary history of a group of organisms, such as this group of foxes that are shown in this diagram. And a phylogenetic tree is a visual hypothesis that represents our current understanding of how these species evolved and how they descended from a common ancestor. And now we will talk about how to interpret a phylogenetic tree. So in a tree, the different branch points, the ends, represents particular groupings of organisms. That grouping could be an individual species, or sometimes the grouping is at a bigger level of classification. This tree shows how different species of foxes came from a common ancestor. So this branch that I'm highlighting represents the ancestor of all of these species shown here. So at some point in time, there was one ancestral fox species. Here where you see the line branch represents the point in time when this ancestral fox diverged or split into two different species of foxes. This branch gradually became bat-eared foxes. And then this branch, over here we have an ancestor that gradually gave rise to all of the other species pictured here. This ancestor split at this point in time. One of these lineages gave rise to raccoon dogs. And then the other lineage became the ancestor of all of these other foxes. And then this ancestor split again. This branch, what we also refer to as a lineage, gradually split again into these two species. And then this branch became all of these species. So now I'd like to give you a question for you to think about, and we will discuss it in class. So write the answer down. So let's say we focus on the red fox. Which species is more closely related to the red fox? Rupel's fox or the Cape fox? So write down which one you think is more closely related and explain how you know. So now let's talk about how phylogenies are determined. How do we know which species are more closely related to each other and came from a more recent common ancestor? So this is largely done by studying homologies. So homologies, to remind you, are similarities due to common ancestry. Homologies can exist in morphology, such as comparing these bone structures. There can also be homologies in biochemistry, such as studying the chemical reactions that occur in the cells of different organisms. And we can also look at homologies in DNA and protein sequences, such as what's shown here. Now, to be able to determine accurate phylogenies, we need to be able to distinguish a homology from something called a homoplasy. So a homology is a similarity that exists between two organisms due to their shared common ancestry. 
However, a homoplasy, sometimes called an analogy, is a similarity that's not due to a recent common ancestor, but due to something called convergent evolution. And so convergent evolution is what occurs when organisms from different lineages, from different branches of the evolutionary tree, evolve to have similar adaptations due to similar environmental pressures. I'd like to give you an interesting example of convergent evolution. So when you look at these pictures of these two plants, wouldn't you think they're both cactuses? But actually, only the one on the left is a cactus. This plant belongs to a family of plants called cactaceae, which evolved in the continents of South America and North America. Whereas the one on the right belongs to a family called Euphorbiaceae, which evolved in Africa. When we trace back their evolutionary history, we can see that this cactus shares a more recent common ancestor with carnations than it does with the Euphorbia. And the Euphorbia shares a more recent common ancestor with violets than it does with the cactus. Now, how did this happen? Well, both of these groups of plants evolved in very hot and dry areas. So natural selection selected for individuals that had adaptations that allowed them to survive the dry conditions. These asterisks mark convergent evolution, independent evolution of traits that were very similar, such as these thick stems and very small leaves. The way we know that these um, characteristics are homoplasies and not homologies is that if we trace back in time to the most recent common ancestor between euphorbia and cactuses, this common ancestor did not have those adaptations, did not have thick stems and small leaves. So there was independent evolution due to similar environmental pressures. Another interesting example of convergent evolution is the one I mentioned at the beginning of this lesson, the similarity between the eastern glass lizard and snakes in that they both lack limbs. If we look at their phylogenetic history, this eastern glass lizard is more closely related to other lizards and to iguanas. So this was convergent evolution marked by these stars. If we go back in time to find the common ancestor between eastern glass lizards and snakes, this common ancestor had limbs. So this ancestor it branched off one lineage eventually led to an ancestral organism that gradually lost limbs and that ancestor then diverged into all the different species of snakes. This branch diverged to form iguanas and then other lizards. And then here we have the branching that gradually led to eastern glass lizards that independently lost limbs. So the loss of limbs represents a homoplasy, not a homology. In the previous two examples, when I explained to you how we knew that those similarities were homoplasies and not homologies, I showed you the phylogenetic trees. And yet, to be able to create a good phylogenetic tree, we first need to know which similarities are homologies versus homoplasies, because only homologies are useful for making good phylogenetic trees. So how do we do this? Let's take the example of a human and a dog. Both have multiple similarities, such as having four limbs. Is the presence of four limbs a homology or a homoplasy? Well, there's one way of determining this is to look at the fossil record. So when we take these two species and trace back their evolutionary history through fossils, 
we can see how closely related they are, and then we can examine their common ancestor to, to determine whether that common ancestor had those same adaptations. We can also do detailed comparisons of the structures. So let's say, uh, let's take the human limb and a dog limb. You can look at the internal bone structure of both of these. So if the two structures are very complex and they share multiple elements, then it's much more likely that they evolved in the common ancestor, that it wasn't independent evolution. The chances of this exact combination of these bones evolving two separate times independently is much less likely. So these are homologous structures. If on the other hand, you compared two structures that were only superficially similar, but their internal structure wasn't very similar, then that's more likely to be a homoplasy. So far, we looked at homologies in structure or morphology, but we can also use molecular homologies to determine how closely related different species are and to be able to trace their phylogenetic um, relationships. So scientists use complex computer programs to compare both DNA sequences and protein sequences from different organisms to see how related they are. So let's take this example. This shows a very short DNA sequence from two species. And if you just look at it with your eyes, you can see that the first two letters are the same and that this part of the species one is the same as this segment of the sequence from species two. So a computer program would create an alignment that looks like this. It would show how in this region they're identical and in this region, they're identical. But as these species diverged from a common ancestor, there was some type of mutation, either a deletion mutation that deleted these three nucleotides or an insertion mutation that resulted in the insertion of these nucleotides. We have no way of knowing what happened, but what we can say is that this similarity suggests that this sequence existed in the common ancestor that is shared between these two species. Now, this is a very short sequence, so we wouldn't be able to have a very strong evidence from this, but we can look at much uh, longer sequences. So this is a computer-generated alignment of a sequence of the protein cytochrome C from three mammals, human, rhesus monkey, mouse, and a plant called Arabidopsis. So the way you read this is that each of these letters represents an amino acid. So the first line is the human cytochrome C, second line is the rhesus monkey, third line is the mouse, and fourth line is the plant Arabidopsis cytochrome C. And in dark gray, it, the computer program shows you where they have identical sequences. So when you compare them, you can see that the human and the rhesus monkey are almost identical. The mouse is still very, very similar, but has a few more differences. And the plant is quite a bit more different than these mammals, but they're still pretty big regions of identical regions of this protein. So we can use this to determine which of these species are the most closely related to each other. So, so far we focus on doing comparisons of morphology or sequences, molecular comparisons. But these are not the only comparisons you can look at. We could also compare the chemical reactions inside cells to look at which organisms have more similar biochemistry we could also do comparisons of behavior and other types of comparisons. But I'd like to leave you with a question. Of the two comparisons we focused on, morphological versus molecular, which one is more likely going to yield an accurate phylogeny? So think about it, write down some initial thoughts, 
and we'll discuss it in class. So finally, let's do a summary of what we discussed. So you learned how to read or interpret a phylogenetic tree. We discussed what a homology versus a homoplasy is, and that it is very crucial to be able to distinguish these because only homologies are useful for creating phylogenetic trees. And then we discussed the use of morphological versus molecular comparisons that will then help us begin creating phylogenetic trees.